I don't buy it, but sure. <laughs> All right. So um, I'm going to start off. We always have to start off asking you guys questions and, and making sure we're awake and uh, uh, ready to go, right? So has anyone ever had um, one of those relationships or friendships where you felt like you were the one that had to do all of the work to keep it going? Anybody? Everybody's been there, right? We've all been there. It, it can be absolutely frustrating. You, you make a call over or, or uh, um, over and over. You, you try and get a hold of them, whatever. You text message them uh, or you email them and you get no answer. Or as um, kids today would say, they left you red. Okay? That, that means you read their text and you didn't answer, okay? Um, I only say that because I just learned that last year. Um, but it puts stress on your friendship and on your relationships, okay? And it eventually will start to w make you start to wonder if it even matters, if you matter to that person at all, right? If, if there's anything uh, um, that is even worth fighting for. It's easy to become resentful, of that person that's not showing that you matter to them. Because people show what their priorities are with their time, their talent, and their treasures. Does that sound familiar? Yeah? It's not just here. It's in our whole life. Sometimes you make, a, make sure you make that extra effort for people who are important to us. We... We do that well, and sometimes um, if they don't or, or we struggle to, maybe it shows us how important that person may or may not be in our actual lives because it may be harder. But let me ask you this. Do you think of your relationship with God the same way you think of your relationship with people here on earth? If not, why not? Why? After all, it's clear that God wants a relationship with you. He never stops reaching out to you. But how often do you stop to listen or put that extra effort towards a relationship with him? This week, we're going to continue our series over our discipleship pathway. Last week we talked about worship, right? And we talked about how we are called to come and worship God and, and sing out with everything we can because everything we have here in this church and in our lives is from God, right? So we're called to, to be a part of that. We're called to celebrate that. We come here to fill our tanks and thank God for the amazing things he does in our lives. And when we are struggling, we come to find comfort in him. Although sometimes we talked about we tend to avoid if we're the ones that mess up. Because you can hide from it for some reason. But if this is all we do, if this on Sunday morning is all we do, is it enough? The easiest answer, without being a complete jerk, <laughs> is it's a good start. It is a very good start. But let me ask you something. What, and I want uh, audible answers, and, and, and some of you may have answers that are correct, but these are the two most commonly answered to this question. What are the two things that the majority of our churches in our country have in common? Two things. Declining membership. That's one. What's the other one? Oh, you want me to give you a hint? You're doing it right now. There we go. Worship. <laughs> okay. Two most common things in the uh, American church, and I want to stress, the American church is they have a worship service and they're shrinking. So let me ask this. Is this enough? 
Preach. <laughs> it's not working, right? It's not. Worship. Worship in, the, in churches across America. It may be on Sunday. It may be on Saturday. It may be on Wednesday night. It really doesn't make a difference. Okay? It is a common practice across all of the United States. And the reason I say the United States is they don't necessarily get to worship in some foreign countries, right? We take this for granted often. That's why I am so, every time we come in and pray, I, I always mention, God, thank you for giving us this place because I don't have to worry like it's China, like we could all have somebody come in here and arrest us and throw us in jail. But we take that for granted a lot, don't we? So it's not a common thing. But the funny thing is, oh, oh man, that's going to get to the end of it. Whew. It's frustrating because you know what the churches in China aren't doing? Shrinking. They're growing. Then we talk about the dying, the shrinking. And, a, and thank you for saying it the way you did. Thank you for saying membership. Okay? Because... Because we have the, the membership ideal, and, and we all know, and you guys went through this when, when you went through the disaffiliation stuff, you, you had to figure out all your membership, right? You had to figure out who was there, who wasn't, all that stuff, who's actually a member. Um, and in the GMC, one of the main topics we had is what does membership actually mean? Because really, it's just a piece of paper that says you're a member if you're never here, right? <laughs> but the first step we're going to look at is... Um, oh my gosh, I, I, oh, the, this is a Gallup poll. Anybody heard of Gallup polls? Okay, they're one of the more common ones. Um, Pew Research, they would give me the information, but they're going to make me pay for it, which was a new thing. So we're going to use Gallup. Anybody want to take a guess at what percentage of the U.S. in 1938 was a member of a church? Anybody want to take a guess? Close. Relatively. 73. It got as high as 1948 went to 76%. Okay? That's pretty good, right? Membership. Again, membership. Doesn't mean you actually go to church. Yeah, not attendance yet. We'll get there. But membership was at 90 or 76% as high as in 19. It was basically during World War II that it went way up. Does anybody want to guess what it was in 20, what's this one, 2018? A little higher. It was 50. 50, exactly. You're going to be preaching by the time you're 10. <laughs> Test me. 50%. <laughs> it is now, for the first time, membership in the United States in the first time in history is now under 50%. For the first time in history of the U.S., we are under 50% in membership. Okay? But that's just membership. Let's take a further look by average attendance. Average attendance is somewhere between 30 and 31%. 30 and 31 percent. Here's what gets frustrating. I don't have anybody to invite to church, Pastor. Shut up. <laughs> you do. 31 percent of the country is going on a good day. You have people you can invite. You do. Sorry, I'm, if you haven't figured it out yet, I'm pretty blunt. So take it good and bad. And here's the thing, the other thing you always hear. People want to blame COVID. Oh, well, pastor, just people aren't coming back because of COVID. Anybody want to take a shot at the number of what it was pre-COVID? What percentage? 34. 3% drop in a three-year period is actually not bad in comparison to the rest of them. Because from 2017 to 2018, there was a 5% drop. Some of the biggest drops recently has been since 9-11, uh, uh, um, and the 10 years after that, there was a large drop because we had a spike in 9-11.
for obvious reasons. People were looking for hope. So that excuse for COVID is out the window. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to the book of John, because we're going to be reading uh, the book of John and uh, chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. And while you look for that, um, if some of you ever get out your phone and use your phone, uh, the version we're using today, because it drives me nuts when I have a version that um, isn't the one the pastor's using, because like, this isn't the words, and the words are important today. Um, I'm using ESV today because my three favorite versions are CEB, ESV, and NIV, and there's no judgment for anybody that's outside of those. Those are just my three favorite because they're the least complicated for me, and they're not so watered down that it doesn't have any meaning behind it, okay? Um, Those are the most common ones I'll read in here. But um, as we read this here today, I want us to be a little bit more attentive on focus on the words that are in the scripture. That's why I was telling you it's ESV. Because of the word, a single change of a word can change the whole context of everything you are reading. And that's why we're using ESV today. We're reading John chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. The truth will set you free. So Jesus said to the Jews... Who had believed in him. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciple. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered, Uh, Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are the offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I've seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Man, that gets stronger every week. I love it. We are called in Scripture to abide in Jesus' word. Abide in Jesus' word. And it goes on to tell us that we are, are, are set free. Because Jesus, But it's because Jesus' word is truth, and the truth shall set us free. And how many of you have heard that saying before? Almost all of us, right? Even if it's not from reading scripture, it's been in multiple movies, okay? Uh, and, and so this is something that is very common, and we've mostly heard quoted. But I want us to look closely at one word today. I want us to look really closely at one word, because the meaning of that word changes everything. Jesus says to abide in his word. He doesn't say listen. He doesn't say read. Or just pay attention. He says abide. While I was studying this sermon, I kind of fell in love with this word. Okay? I really did. So I might say it a thousand more times. Now that I know more and looked further into it. Do we have any English teachers or people that that was their strong, strong subject? Anybody? Seriously? Are y'all lying? <laughs> Somebody had to be good at English. <gasps> Marcy. Marcy? Got a question for you. Uh, uh, what type of word is abide? Is it a noun, adjective, pronoun, verb? What kind of word is it? It's a verb. It's a verb. Verb. Hey. I got a question for you. What is a verb? Action. action word. It's an action word. That changes everything, right? It doesn't mean just to, to hey, you know, uh, abide, just look at the word, whatever. It means to stay and remain in his word. Let me ask you this. How 
are you studying or remaining in his word if the only real time you open your scripture is here? How are you remaining in his word? How are you staying in his word? How are you abiding if the only time that action takes place is Sunday morning? That, that wasn't rhetorical. Are you saying, are you abiding in his word if that's it? No. To abide in Jesus' word means to continue believing what Jesus said and walking in obedience with him. And that means staying and studying even when it's hard. Even when that means putting part of your time away for him. When I first became a Christian, I went to church on Wednesdays, and sometimes Sundays. I didn't really like Sundays because our, our Wednesday night group, the band rocked way harder, okay? They turned the volume way up, and if any of the adults, uh, older adults would have been there when we had that volume cranked up, we probably would have gotten in trouble because it was probably cracking some drywall. <laughs> it was loud. We had smoke machines and lights and all this stuff, and so that was the only time I really wanted to go. It was the best Music. Does that mean I wasn't growing as a Christian? No, I was. I was, I was finally listening to the word. I was finally growing and, and paying attention to what the preacher was saying. But eventually my faith became stagnant. Who's had that? I mean, everybody's had that really hard or really hard uh, high school course or really high, hard college course where if you would have studied one day a week, there was no way you were ever going to pass. And you were willing to put aside two, three days a week to sit and look and read something that honestly, once you pass that class, you probably forgot. Anybody want to tell me about organic, organic chemistry? Anybody? No. Because <laughs> once you get through it, you're done. This is something that lasts forever and we give it an hour. This is something that determines your eternity and we say, ah, two, three days is too much to read. This is what I struggled with. I don't know why, because I never actually studied anything else. I never went to school. <laughs> it wasn't until I put God first and started actually digging in more than one day a week that my life began to change and people started to notice. You know what's funny? When you begin to have that change inside of yourself, you'll be the last one to know. Because everyone will see it first. The first people to see it, let me tell you right now, are teenagers. Because they can see when somebody's full of it faster than anyone. If you're unsure of somebody, bring a teenage girl or something with you and be like, what do you think? Yeah, they're a creeper. <laughs> <laughs> they'll know right away. They know that stuff. But when I started going and I started going and putting my life and putting God first in small groups, something started to happen. And we talked about this earlier. The church is in great decline. But do you know what the number one reason for churches that are growing is? Amazing small group ministry. It's not the band. It's not the, the uh, uh, influence of the young or the old or the, the youth, the whatever. The number one most common thing. Those things factor in. But the number one most common theme was amazing small group ministry. Amazing small groups. Because people, when they're digging into God's word together and abiding in his teachings, can't help but start to see change in themselves. Can't help but start to talk about it more. Can't help but to put more of themselves into the church and its community. They're growing and becoming 
the best versions of themselves as men and women of Christ, but also investing right back into the other people in the church. We will learn about more about investing into each other next week when we talk about fellowship. And one of the most successful churches that I've ever followed or, or listened and sit in there, one of the things, as a pastor, obviously, we say this is the place we come to get filled up. It's hard to be filled up when you're the one preaching, okay? So one of the things, most common things pastors do is they'll just have in their office or whatever, they'll have stuff playing, like different pastors. There's five or six different pastors I listen to pretty often. Um, and uh, uh, you sit and lear lin la, learn from them and listen to them. And one of the guys I followed had this saying that I'll never forget, and I, I will say it and preach it and teach it until the day I die. The pastor said this, I want to build a church of small groups, not be a church with small groups. What's the difference? Because there is a difference. Do you hear it? The church of small groups makes it the number one priority. It's the number one thing. Because if we want to grow, it takes more than a decent sermon on Sunday morning. You actually have to dig into your word. How, put it this way. If you went, if somebody is having an operation and you went and your doctor said, I really listened to my instructors, so don't worry, I got this surgery in the bag. Did you ever study? Well, no. <laughs> I listened to the instructors. I'm good. Anybody going to have that surgery somewhere else? <laughs> I am. I'm going somewhere else in a heartbeat. Because it's the practicing and implementing it that makes all the difference. It's the thing that changes you. Because if we want to grow, it takes more than that. It takes small groups of people that truly fall in love with the word of God and want to abide in it together. Want to build those lasting relationships. Because wherever two or more gathered, that is where Jesus is. That is where the Holy Spirit is. And that's where we're where work is happening in people's lives. It's not something anymore to check off a list and say, I got this done. It's actually living and abiding in the word and his love and his patience and the presence of the Holy Spirit. To live in the fact of knowing that God's grace is available for all. All they need to do is receive it. But if you aren't ready, if you aren't studying up, are you ready to tell somebody that? But let me tell you this. If you choose to live this way, if you choose to dive in and say, you know what? I'm not going to commit one day. I'm going to commit two. I'm going to commit three. There is a warning label that should come with it. Because it's going to wreck your life. And not in a bad way. Because you are going to change. You will not be able to dive into God's word and remain the same person you are. Does that mean you're going to wake up and be sinless after a month of going to a small group? No. Sorry. <laughs> Wish it was that easy. But you will grow and you'll find yourself caring and loving scripture more. And loving God more. Because you'll see everything that comes. And maybe it may change little things here and there. It may be big things. He may tell you that he wants you to do something that you are not comfortable with. He may ask you to do something that you don't feel worthy of. He may ask you to become a pastor even though you failed speech class. Even though you literally finally get a job offer the day after you graduate your apprenticeship. And it's like, yeah, journeyman scale. Oh, I got the pastor job. Never going to see those checks. <laughs> But the truth is, as long as you abide in the word and abide in the presence of the Holy Spirit, all things are possible. You just have to say yes and make that commitment. Amen?
Amen. That being said, 